my name is Pascal Crow. I'm the Data and Democracy uh, Program Officer at Open Rights Group. And for the past year and a half, I've been looking at the use of personal data by political parties. Um, and this report, who do they think we are? Political parties, political profiling and the law kind of summates the findings that we've we've discovered over the past year um, and outlined some policy recommendations as well. Before we begin, I'm just going to do a little bit of housekeeping. Um, so basically, I'm going to run through the report today. We're also launching a tool alongside this report, which will allow people to interpret the results of a data subject access request or DSAR that they send to political parties to get a copy of the data back that is held on them by political parties. Um, but I think for you guys, for this uh, policy audience this morning, I'm going to focus mainly on the content of the report and I'll probably gloss a little bit um, on the um, tool at the end, but mainly I'm going to go through the report. So, yeah, uh, and if anybody wants to ask questions, I'll run through the report first. Um, you can ask questions by clicking on the question section of the GoToWebinar control panel. Um, it'll come up with your name and a question, and then I'll answer those questions at the end. Um, also, we are recording this, uh, this broadcast, but um, none, of, none of your uh, webcams or audio is on at the moment. Uh, so that's not being recorded. So it should really just be me that's being recorded. Okay, great. So without further ado, I'm going to um, go through the report and kind of summarise the findings. And then I look forward to hearing some questions from you guys. So, first of all, a little bit about Open Rights Group. Um, the report is called, Who Do They Think We Are? Political Parties, Political Profiling and the Law. So, as you may or may not know, Open Rights Group is a UK-based digital campaigning organisation. We work on uh, privacy, freedom of speech, and state surveillance. Um, but there are the 3,000 active supporters. We are a grassroots organisation with local groups across the UK. Um, and in terms of the kind of the work on data protection within which um, this project sits, uh, recently uh, we've challenged the migration exemption to UK data protection law. Um, defended the uh, GDPR from attempts to water down its provisions uh, and uh, challenged the kind of the online ad tech e ecosystem. Um, and I'd like to thank my colleagues Matthew Rice, uh, our Scotland Director, and Mariano, our Legal and Policy Officer, for their valuable contributions to this report, uh, particularly on the on the legal section. So. The political use of personal data has been hitting kind of UK headlines since the Cambridge Analytica scandal uh, and that mainly so far that scrutiny has focused on the actions of social media companies and activities on social media. However, the role of political parties who often, you know, commission this activity, who pay for the ads and who uh, devise political profiles upon which kind of uh, other, pro uh, other profiling activity, including ads, is based, that role has been ignored and the parties themselves have so far managed to avoid scrutiny. So we spent the past year exam examining the use of personal data by political parties. We've released innovative policy proposals, given evidence to select committees and conducted the groundbreaking digital rights campaign during the 2019 general election and that informs the content of this report. Um, we consider the use of personal data by political parties to be particularly concerning um, parties claim to have a lawful basis to have to uh, conduct activities that are generally considered unacceptable for social media companies. Um, we're particularly concerned by the use of the uh, democratic engagement lawful basis for data profiling, which is used by parties to justify a wide range of profiling activities. So to get a better sense of the kind of uh, profiling that political parties are conducting, uh, uh, we did a research campaign during the last general election where we encouraged members of the public to make uh, data subject access requests to UK political parties. Uh, the right of subject access uh, lets an individual get a copy of the information held on them by any organisation um, and we developed a tool to allow the public uh, to do that. Uh, then after gaining, gaining, gaining informed consent from uh, some uh, people who took part in that uh, study, um, we analysed uh, a number of their responses. I'm just going to kind of gloss over some of the preliminary conclusions now. 
Um, so although it's assumed that all political parties conduct some degree of profiling, uh, we only received significant results from the Labour Party, the Conservative and Unionist Party, uh, and the Lib Dems. And that's probably to do with our fairly limited sampling. I think most of our respondents were based in England, probably based in cities, probably male. Um, and you know, I'm sure if you were to do a kind of nation by nation study, you'd find some interesting results from other political parties. Um, but uh, given the sampling, uh, we've got probably the, the most results from the biggest parties, which is probably what you'd expect. Um, the results were fairly startling, in, and in particular, we found extensive, extensive use of personal data uh, to try and guess characteristics such as income, number of children, religion, and nationality. And then this is used in an attempt to tailor a political relationship with that person. And what we mean by that is that the political profiles that uh, political uh, parties generate on voters um, are used for activities we think such as canvassing, fundraising, comms, and possibly kind of policy development as well. Um, but I'll come on to that later in, in our report. Broadly, we found that Labour was conducting the most sophisticated political profiling in-house, uh, followed by uh, the Tories and the Liberal Democrats. Um, obviously, we all know that, you know, there is a, a broad uh, kind of political consultancy uh, market out there, and that the, the, the Tories and the Liberal Democrats do outsource some of this activity, we think, to third parties. But in terms of the roles and responsibilities that party headquarters themselves have, Labour was by far conducting the most sophisticated political profiling. All political parties attempted to profile both personal information and highly protected special category data, such as religion and political opinions. A really interesting finding that we found was that generally, the accuracy of political profiling was actually extremely poor. And again, I'll come on to that later in the report. And we think that relationship is worth exploring further. Um, and finally, um, political parties uh, demonstrated a confused understanding of data protection law. But equally, you know, our results have shown that the law itself is extremely confusing and that there's a real legal gray area um, in terms of data protection law uh, and the use of personal data by political parties in, United, in the United Kingdom. Um, in that grey area resides a myriad of data practices from purchasing commercial data, processing special category data, and uh, inferring uh, political opinions. So not only does this leave voters in the dark about what political parties do with their personal data, it also means that, you know, currently there's no well-established precedent for what political parties definitely can and definitely can't do with personal data, and, the, and you know, more specifically, the kind of the type of, the, the kind of the scope of personal data that political parties are allowed to use for profiling. There's no ring fence around the limits of how they're allowed, allowed to profile. These practices, we think, have the potential to seriously undermine trust in the democratic process and damage its integrity. And, you know, the integrity of our electoral outcomes depends on everybody buying into the results. And if that kind of trust in buying into the results is undermined, then that's going to damage the fabric of our democracy. So we have three key recommendations which I'm going to kind of outline now and I'll come over to in more detail towards the end. The first recommendation is to regulate the scope of the democratic engagement lawful basis in the Data Protection Act 2018 and make sure that the ICO uh, clearly uh, enforce against it. Secondly, implement collective redress which would allow organisations to take forward public interest uh, strategic digital, digital rights litigation without the need for individual claimants. And finally, um, that political parties should move to a consent-based opt-in model of political profiling, because we think that would allow for the benefits, the, the undoubted benefits of targeted political communications and so forth, uh, whilst also, um, you know, preserving privacy and, you know, uh, making sure that individual digital rights are respected. So I'm going to now run through um, the results that we got back from each individual party and uh, just kind of detail some of the kind of the really wacky findings that we found. Um, I should just say that these results are not exhaustive. Um, every party had multiple, multiple, multiple scores um, and there is a details in a working paper um, that we can share on request. So firstly, the response from Labour. So none of the data subjects, none of the participants in our study 
who sent these SARs uh, received a meaningful response within the statutory time limit. Um, so we had to essentially rely on uh, results that all staff had received prior to the prior to the kind of broader public facing campaign that we that we ran. Um, so luckily we had two instances, uh, two complete DSARs from Labour to look at in that instance. So of the ones that we looked at from Labour, Labour were compiling up to 100 pages of data, data points per individual, and those are broken down into over 80 categories. The DSAR gave the name of a data point, a description, a dictionary of how to interpret the value of each data point, which was generally given numerically, um, the source of that data and the legal break and the legal basis for processing that data and so yeah the following is, an, is a non-exhaustive list of what we found so in terms of the data sources they list they listed uh, labor were purchasing data from commercial suppliers using data from the electoral register calculating some scores from the labor party um, and then in terms of kind of what they were actually trying to measure and we've, we've kind of developed some arbitrary groupings such as family life, social status, uh, and religious and political views that we've uh, used across across the parties. Um, so Labour were attempting to measure whether a person had children or not, uh, who the head of the household was, I'm not really sure what that was supposed to mean, um, and how much money people make. As well as kind of, you know, kind of perhaps more expected political views, uh, scoring such as the Remain score, or like, you know, how likely you were to switch between a party. So moving on to the Lib Dems, um, we got 25 DSAR responses back from the Lib Dems, and they contained a mix of uh, descriptive data, a uh, mixture of inferential data, and it was predominantly based on uh, the electoral role. Um, many of the DSAR responses were virtually blank, by which I mean they'd have like a data point and there'd be no value for that uh, corresponding data point, which kind of suggests that, you know, although the Lib Dems were maybe like aspiring to a more sophisticated and comprehensive in-house profiling like Labour were doing, um, they hadn't yet achieved it, although that could just uh, reflect issues with our sampling. You know, maybe in very St Edmunds, they're profiling people en masse and in detail. Um, and, we, and we know the Lib Dems outsource some processing to their company, CACI. Um, and we found, for example, um, attempting to guess um, how many different fam how many different families lived in a home, trying to guess somebody's age based on their name, uh, their kind of uh, political opinions, such as whether someone would like to be a soft Tory or not, um, and uh, some kind of similar instances. And again, uh, if anybody would like to see these kind of results in more detail. Um, just message me after the event and I'll, I'll be more than happy to share the working paper which kind of really digs deep into the, the, the data points that we, that we saw here. But as I said, on the whole, the Lib Dems was not as sophisticated as the other two. <clears throat> Finally, I'll just talk a little bit about what we got back from the, from the Conservative Party. So we analysed 17 uh, data subject access request responses from the Conservative and Unionist Party. Um, on the whole, they contained more inferential data, such as demographic information and scores, than the Liberal Democrats. Um, a lot of this information had been purchased from Experian, and that was also the case for Labour as well, um, although La Labour seemed to be calculating a lot of scores off the back of that. Um, um, you know, we know that the Conservatives outsource a lot of profiling um, to a company called Hanbury Strategy, and, that, and that's basically a matter of public record. Um, but in terms of kind of the in-house profiling within the Conservative Party, this is what we saw. So we saw data coming from the marked register, a lot of data coming from Experian. Um, and in terms of the kind of things that seem to be important to the Conservative Party is how many children an individual has, um, again, how many people living in a home, um, quite a lot of emphasis on things like social status, such as a person's income, person's education level. Um, kind of quite funny classic example is how likely an individual was to read the Daily Mail or have that as their favourite newspaper. Um, 
moving on to religious and political views, we saw some quite sort of idiosyncratic and um, fairly kind of interesting nomenclatures, shall I say, from the Tories in this regard. So the Tories were attempting to uh, estimate a person's mysticism, which uh, appeared to be their term for religion. Um, and they also were interested in, in an individual's uh, mother tongue, uh, which was seems to be an attempt to record an individual's first language. And we consider this to be a proxy for nationality, possibly ethnicity, um, but we're not, not completely sure. Um, but I would say broadly that seems to be a proxy for nationality. Great, so I've kind of run through our kind of preliminary findings of the sort of data that we saw from the DSAR results, but I'm going to talk a little bit now about the research that we did about how accurate those profiles were. And I think um, there's there's been quite a, a broad gap in opinion between kind of, you know, the public and to an extent some parts of the, some parts of the media and academia about just like how accurate and how useful political profiling is. Um, and I think, you know, although there's been some research into uh, kind of whether the statistical models that political profiling uses are likely to be accurate or not, I believe this is the first time where people who have received their profiles back from political parties have been asked if they felt they were accurate or not. And I think this kind of goes really to the heart of the matter because the kind of the business case for the use of political profiles is that it, it kind of confers an electoral advantage not seen by traditional forms of kind of voter segmentation or advertising or focus groups, you know, that sort of thing. And it feels often like the use of uh, uh, personal data for political campaigning has kind of captured, you know, the Cambridge Analytica has captured the public imagination in a kind of Watergate-esque manner. And as I said, at its kind of most like, like maximalist reading, um, you know, critics say that um, the use of personal data uh, to tailor individual political relationships can result almost in the form of kind of mind control that make people vote in ways they otherwise would not. And it ties into this whole thing of, you know, they use data to know you better than you know yourself, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and, you know, that, that undermines uh, the results of elections. Um, However, you know, it has to be said, a growing body of evidence points to the conclusion that despite the claims of the political data science industry, profiling is not as effective or sophisticated as it appears. Um, and that certainly seems to be, have been the experience of those who received DSAR responses from UK political parties. So when we asked people um, what did, if they thought um, their DSAR responses were correct. Um, so we asked a number of participants who took part in the initial campaign if they would complete a short survey about how accurate the DSAR responses were. So on the whole, 57% of uh, participants in that survey agreed most of the statements that uh, their responses uh, were mostly or wholly inaccurate. So nearly 60% of people that we polled uh, felt that their DSAR responses didn't reflect them. And only 3% agreed most with the statement uh, that the results of my political subject actress request were completely accurate. So that's a pretty damningly low number of accurate profiling and a pretty damningly high uh, level of inaccurate profiling. Um, and I, you know, I should add some caveats. Of course, our sample here was, complete, was, was quite small. I think it was only 30 or so people at time of writing here. I would add though, that this survey is, is still live. We're still encouraging people who got DSAR results back um, to uh, contribute to it. And the proportion of people who felt that their DSAR responses were mostly or wholly inaccurate has gone up. So it's, it's con like nominally, it's concentrating towards the kind of inaccurate uh, frame. So, you know, that's quite, that's quite a kind of damning conclusion for how good political profiling is. And you know, we had some kind of funny comments from people that took part in the survey, such as, uh, you know, felt like I was reading a strange hybrid caricature with very little resemblance to me, um, grossly inaccurate, um, identified me as a tabloid reading labor lever with poor education, all of which is, is, is correct, is incorrect. Uh, and, um, you know, the responses were laughable in their accuracy. 
However, that's not to say that these inaccuracies diminish the concerns felt by many participants, and it still doesn't mean that they're, you know, uh, uh, bad. Uh, for example, you know, many uh, some participants felt that although the responses were, were inaccurate, they still felt angry that parties were profiling me and other voters to this extent. One felt stereotyped based on characteristics. Um, another considered the profiling to be an attempted invasion of my privacy, with one going as far as to say I felt spied upon. Um, you can see one participant felt that um, they hadn't consented to their data being used in this way. Um, I think most significantly, though, one participant was really concerned about the effect of this kind of profiling and kind of the relationship of this kind of political profiling to other forms of profiling. And I think this is particularly pertinent to the data from Experian that political parties use, the kind of the commercial um, credit card uh, data and kind of credit data that they purchase. Um, one participant said it was inaccurate on some important details that might affect credit and other important things in my life, made me feel anxious and powerless. Um, and I think what that means is that he was thinking, well, hang on, you know, first of all, the data is inaccurate, but now I'm worried that, you know, lines of credit and things like mortgages uh, might be difficult to get if this is what Experian think of me. And you can see that they're tying their association of their kind of their credit rating and the kind of service that Experian and other commercial data brokers provide to the information that is contained within the profiling. Um, and it seems clear to me that this activity, you know, however inaccurate it is, it has a real human cost. Um, and you know, people didn't like it and it made them concerned about their credit ratings and uh, you know, other, other areas of their activity in the information economy. The root fundamentally here is um, one of human, the root problem is one of human dignity. Um, information held about people needs to be accurate. For example, uh, you know, GDPR and the Data Protection Act 2018 requires data to be accurate as a principle of use. Um, you know, as a potential solution, political parties could explore other less intrusive forms of profiling. <coughs> for example, such as by geographic area. Although that's not uh, without controversy and the, be and the benefits are similarly contested, um, this would be much less likely to data protection, to engage data protection law. But, you know, I think fundamentally, I, I would say this to political parties, it seems that the political profiling you're undertaking is highly inaccurate and probably purchasing commercial data from Experian, et cetera, et cetera, is like, is, you know, it's very expensive. You're not really getting that much out of it. Um, they seem to be informing very inaccurate voter profiles, so you're missing out on, you know, tappable parts of the electorate. At the same time, when people find out about this practice, they're linking the practices back to how they're viewed and how they're worried they're viewed by uh, credit data uh, uh, data brokers such as Experian, and they're tying in their view of the political parties with organisations and forms of data collection that they clearly have an issue with. So there's clearly a kind of reputational risk issue here for the parties. So if this kind of profiling costs a lot, isn't accurate, and uh, poses a real reputational risk, it's kind of unclear what the business case for its continuation is. It's, it's very unclear to me what political parties gain from this sort of activity, really. Um, and maybe that's because, you know, in the post on the post Cambridge Analytical world, world, there's been this kind of rush to personal data as a, as a kind of magic bullet for political campaigning. But if the quality of profiling is as low as it is here, then it really is unclear kind of whether that's worked or not, or, or it's fairly clear that it hasn't worked. Um, and, you know, I think my, my key recommendation would be that political parties should uh, really take note of that and carefully consider whether benefits of profiling in this way outweigh the risks to them and I would suggest uh, based on these findings that they do not. Okay so I'm just going to kind of briefly go over our conclusions before going on to talk about the law. Um, so first of all and this is probably quite an unsurprising conclusion uh, 
bigger the party, roughly correlating to the size of the membership, um, the more sophisticated profiling we saw. So obviously, Labour had the most sophisticated, um, the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats had a kind of comparable number of data points. But I'd, I'd say on the whole, um, the Tories' responses were a little bit more kind of complex and trying to dig a little bit deeper. Um, Labour also had uh, the highest and kind of a really significant number of sources of data. Um, so they were using the electoral register, canvassing, commercial data, uh, and the Labour Party itself. Uh, the number of data points that list the Labour Party as a source suggests that they are conducting a significant amount of data processing in-house, um, and that's different to political parties, to other political parties, uh, who we know have outsourced a, sig a significant amount of um, data sharing. And uh, sorry, yeah, let me scroll down a little bit here. So our second conclusion is how are inferences generated and what are they used for? And what that means is, although you know they really, um, it would have been helpful if they did. Uh, the DSR responses didn't provide us full information about how the scores and conclusions were generated. Um, so as a result, firm conclusions were kind of difficult. Uh, kind of inferentially, it seems that. Elements such as the person's name, as stated on the electoral register, uh, uh, perhaps are important uh, facts in determining the likely age and gender and so forth. Um, I should say that um, in, inaccurately gendering, uh, misgendering people was a fairly frequent occurrence in some of the responses. And that's the level of inaccuracy we're seeing. Um, and that the results for each individual, while frequently inaccurate, are unique. Um, it's and we've broadly assumed that this profiling is used to determine a political relationship with a voter. Um, but like, as I alluded to earlier, we're kind of not really sure what that means in practice and kind of where specifically um, different, different legal bases for processing relate to different types of data used for different practices. Um, so, you know, for example, when a political party is processing electoral register data, what local basis are they engaging to process that data? and what activity are they using it for? And I think uh, further research is needed to parse out which data was used for that purpose. I should mention that, um, I'll come on to this in a minute, uh, political parties have got better at stating this in a slightly more granular way, but um, I think uh, further research is, is, is needed to make that a little bit, a little bit more specific and um, privacy policies could be worked on a little bit still. Um, our third recommendation is, um, you know, a third conclusion, rather, is that Experian dominated as a source of commercial data. And, you know, this was really notable, uh, much in the way that Facebook is a kind of one-stop shop for uh, political propaganda or has been described that way. It seems that Experian is, is a one-stop shop for data used in political profiling and has a kind of comparable market position. Finally, you know, and this is the kind of the, possibly the most important conclusion that we found is as I said before, is it worth it? Many people in the study did not recognize the portrait of themselves. People felt the information was, was false. And this was not just the, the case for uh, inferential information that we think they'd guessed, such as political opinions, but far more like fundamental information, such as age, income, and gender. And you know, if you're misgendering someone, that's a really, really basic part of who they are. And it's not only offensive, but you know, it may, it may, it may affect uh, the way in which you choose to engage with them. Um, particularly more for kind of fundamental information such as income. Uh, I would imagine parties use information like that to determine whether someone is, is uh, predominantly left or right. And so this is going to have a real significant effect on the accuracy of profiling and the activity that comes with that. Um, and we know that data processing by political parties is often only the first step of a process that has a number of different branches, which includes social media adverts, but also, you know, more mundane kind of ground war activities such as door knocking and what policy issues canvassers should bring up in conversation with voters. Um, but it's questionable how effective the latter stages of that process can be if they're built on such inaccurate foundations. If political parties want to better understand their voters, it seems low tech solutions such as kind of starting with uh, canvassing and focus, group may, focus groups may provide more accuracy and less legal risk. 
and an over-reliance on commercial data brokers. And that is certainly what we've heard kind of anecdotally from uh, party uh, political practitioners as well, is that kind of information, uh, you know, based on uh, consent and kind of taken at the doorstep uh, with the kind of, you know, face to face with the voter tends to just be more accurate than these kind of broadish assumptions purchased probably very expensively from companies such as Experian that are then used to inform the voter profiles. So I'm going to talk briefly over the law um, and the kind of the, the, the law the law that's engaged in the processing of personal data by political parties. Um, as a caveat, um, I'm sure this will go into too much detail for some and not enough detail for others. Uh, happy to take a couple of questions at the end on this, and um, I'll try and try and set it out as best I can. Um, and so, kind of in summary, um, I'm going to talk about the summary first, and then I'm going to talk about kind of uh, some of the individual lawful bases that are engaged in a little bit more detail. So, in order to process personal data, a data controller must have a lawful basis for that activity. Those lawful bases are set out exhaustively in Article 6 of GDPR. Broadly, political parties process two types of data. There's personal data and there's special category data and there's special category data. Special category data includes uh, things such as political opinions, but also other forms of like more sensitive data, uh, such as religion, uh, political opinion, trade union membership, uh, sexual identity, etc. One lawful basis um, that the political parties use in the processing of data uh, in the is to process per is to process personal data is using the public interest lawful basis, um, which is in GDPR. Section 8E of the DPA 2018 has augmented the concept of public interest by including democratic engagement in its rubric. Um, section 60 there, that's a, a fair error in the copy and we'll change that before we upload it to the website. Um, so political parties have said that they can process personal data in the public interest uh, if, by, uh, if it is necessary for an activity that supports or promotes democratic engagement. And as a result of that, that means that political parties, if they're processing personal data, and that personal data is in the public interest uh, because it's necessary for democratic engagement, they don't have to seek a more consensual lawful basis for processing data, such as consent. In order to process uh, special category data, uh, they have to rely on a more stricter more higher standard uh, lawful basis called uh, substantial public interest. So obviously you can see the bar there for using that kind of information is higher. And what that means is expanded on in uh, paragraph two of schedule one of the, D of the DPA 2018, which states that um, individ specified individuals and organizations can process personal data revealing of political opinions only where such processing is necessary for the purposes of the, of the person's or organization's political activities. So again, uh, political parties can rely, can process political opinions uh, if it's necessary for their uh, purposes, uh, the purposes of their political activities. Uh, and to do so means they don't have to rely on consent. Um, and I think kind of the key the key issue here um, in terms of processing personal data under the democratic uh, engagement lawful basis and schedule one uh, paragraph 22 which allows uh, the processing of political opinion data um, is, the, is the use of the word necessary in both cases processing uh, personal data for democratic engagement uh, must be uh, necessary for an activity that supports or promotes democratic engagement. Similarly, processing data um, under the substantial public interest uh, lawful basis um, must be where processing is necessary for the purpose of the person's or organization's political activities. 
Um, and the ICO have said that um, necess the necessary standard and data protection law, data protection principles still apply, uh, re require the processing to be more than just useful or standard practice. Um, so essentially what that means is these lawful bases do not mean that political parties can process whatever data they want to whatever extent willy-nilly. There, there should be some sort of ring fencing that is ring fenced by the term necessary that puts a limit the, on the kind of types and scope of data processing that is going on. Um, these lawful provisions are complex and open to wide margins of interpretation. Um, and I'll just quickly um, kind of explore, explore why that is. Um, and the lack of certainty as to the meaning is further exacerbated by divergent interpretations of the lawful basis of democratic engagement and uh, a lack of guidance on what constitutes necessary processing. So I'm just going to quickly uh, go through democratic engagement basis in more detail. So as I've said, um, <clears throat> UK political parties rely on the democratic engagement legal basis to process uh, personal data. However, what constitutes democratic engagement has always been um, kind of up for debate. And um, there's, there's a real lack of clarity around what that means, what that means in law. Um, so, for example, the explanatory notes which accompany the Data Protection Act 2018 state that the term democratic engagement is intended to cover a wide range of political activities, including democratic representation, communicating with electors and interested parties, surveying, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. However, the ICO considers democratic engagement to be a lot narrower. So, in their submission to the public uh, bill committee when the Data Protection Bill was going through Parliament, um, they said it was likely to be restricted to activities such as those covered by electoral law, and that was then carried through in their draft framework practice on the use of personal data in political campaigning, where they state that uh, data processing uh, should be supported by additional law. Data processing using these lawful bases should be supported by additional should be supported by additional law, such as electoral law. Now, the difference between the explanatory notes, which say that democratic engagement covers a lot of activities, and the ICO's reading, which says it only covers activity already covered under electoral law, is very big. Uh, and the practices that we've seen are set out in the explanatory notes, uh, such as uh, of, pers of purchasing personal data to match it to voter profiles and use it to communicate uh, with electors, are not clearly within the confines of the DPA 2018 and it could be uh, considered within the outer boundaries of the public interest provision, providing such processing is necessary. However, the ICO's interpretation is far narrower and allows for a much more limited set of activities. So in practice, the difference between these interpretations, uh, between the ICO's interpretation and that of the explanatory notes, uh, is the difference is very big, and so many different practices are like persist. And this is, a, this is a problem both for the integrity of the Data Protection Act and for trust in how political parties handle data. I'm just going to zoom down to um, the section on special category data. And, you know, similarly, both the processing of special category data and um, the processing of personal data rely on this construction uh, of the data protection principle of necessity, activities that uh, processing that is necessary for political activities or processing that is necessary for activities that support democratic engagement. What does necessity mean? So the Conservatives have recently elaborated on what they think uh, democratic engagement means uh, and in their submission to the House of Lords Select Committee on D Democracy and Digital Technologies they cited the example of when an MP sends a birthday card to a constituent at the point at which they turn 18 and can vote. Um, and you know, it's kind of a moot point as to whether that's necessary or creepy um, or whatever, but certainly it could do with interpretation. So I think to conclude on this point on necessity, there's a dire need to bring in the principle of necessity into a practical understanding and provide a suitable ring fence around which political parties can process personal data. And at this stage, we don't see in practice suitable limits to the scope um, of, of, of democratic engagement, uh, largely because of this kind of lack of clarity around what constitutes necessity. We would encourage, and what, and what constitutes democratic engagement, uh, we would encourage greater transparency and scrutiny over what the parties consider to be permissible and impermissible under these conditions.
going to talk briefly about the other legal bases that political parties can rely upon. Um, so political parties uh, have also said in their responses that they rely upon legitimate interests uh, and consent. Um, so political parties can rely on consent to process certain types of data. Um, consent would require parties to be clear and open in order to provide individuals with the opportunity to, uh, to provide a freely given, specific, informed and unambiguous indication of their wishes. Um, by contrast, legitimate interest seems to be relied upon more often to process uh, lots of different types of personal data. Um, however, um, GDPR requires a balancing assessment between the interest of political parties conducting profiling and the rights and freedoms of those being profiled. Um, and uh, at the moment, you know, some parties have not provided an explanation as to how they have conducted that balancing test. Although, you know, to be fair, um, on some political parties, privacy policies recently, and when I say recently, I mean, you know, May, May 2020, um, we've seen uh, political parties uh, alluding to uh, how, they, how they're conducting a balancing test and the fact that they are doing it. Um, but we'd like to see that test and kind of see the results of it. Um, similarly, that balancing test once again engages the principle of necessity and whether the profiling activities undertaken uh, are, likely, are likely that the individual is aware of it. And as we currently lack evidence that political parties are informing individuals, um, it seems to be uh, disproportionate, inaccurate, not transparent. And these are all fundamental elements in determining uh, whether legitimate interest would, would, win, um, would win out in that balancing test. I'm going to say one final thing on special category data. So as I mentioned earlier, um, there is a lawful basis uh, to uh, process special category data uh, under the basis of substantial public interest if it's um, necessary for, for uh, political activities. But that lawful basis is limited to special category data that relates to political opinions. Um, how, so, you know, what you think on political issues. However, we have seen political parties uh, seemingly processing special category data that they are not, that they are not allowed uh, to justify under that lawful basis such as people's religion. You cannot justify processing uh, somebody's uh, religious beliefs under a lawful basis that explicitly states you can only process political opinions. Um, and while it's possible the Conservatives um, could be uh, using a different lawful basis, um, we, we would, uh, it, we would uh, say that they need to provide more clarity on that. Um, and at the moment, they, uh, that seems to be a kind of uh, failure of the data subject, the data subject's rights, that they have not provided legal clarity as to why they think they have the right to process individuals' religious beliefs. So to summarise, lawful uh, on the lawful basis, legitimate interest relies upon a balancing test. Um, we like to see the results of that balancing test and consider it kind of broadly unlikely that profiling of this kind uh, would pass. Um, on special category data, we'd like to understand why political parties think they can process uh, people's religious beliefs and not limit it purely to political opinions and kind of broadly on the use of personal data uh, for political campaigning and the legal basis they're justified under. Um, a lot of it rests upon the data protection principle of necessity and we would like greater clarity in, in the law and I'm sure you know, the political parties would like this as well. Um, we'd like greater clarity on what exactly constitutes necessity here um, and, and how that principle is applied in the processing of personal data uh, for political purposes. Okay, so I'm going to just go over our policy recommendations in full now and then I'll open the floor to questions at the end. So our first recommendation, regulate the scope of the democratic engagement lawful basis in the DPA 2018 and make enforcement count. Regulators should continue to investigate whether the data processing activities of political parties are strictly necessary for activities that support or promote democratic engagement. Um, it's worth noting here that the courts have said that the test of necessity here is a strict one um, or merely a no holds barred attempt to grab any data that might confer some sort of electoral advantage and a clear outline of what this constitutes of what necessity constitutes would make the use of this lawful basis more accountable um, and uh, the ICO have clarified this somewhat in recent guidance 
uh, we'd we would support the incorporation of that guidance into law. Um, and you know, the ICO must enforce against parties where their guidance is clearly contravened. And you know, we've said um, in addition, we think it's unlikely that a lot of profiling would 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 uh, pass the legitimate interest test. Secondly, um, we would like to see uh, the implementation of Article 80.2 of GDPR into domestic law. Uh, and the reason for that is, as our research has made clear, there's a vast amount of political profiling that is going on under voters' nose, noses um, without them ever knowing about it. And if, they, if, if this voter profiling is, is opaque to individuals, it makes it far less likely they're going to be able to um, you know use their rights to the fullest extent or even at all um, and so article 80.2 of the GT of the GDPR enfranchised member states to authorize a body organization or association to lodge a complaint with the uh, relevant uh, supervisory authority uh, we didn't take that up um, and at the moment uh, we cannot take a collective complaint uh, we cannot take the initiative on a data protection case even when there is a clear public interest basis um, as I've just said it's not only unrealistic to expect members of the public to be fully aware of when their rights are infringed, there's many vested interests in preventing them from being thus aware. Um, so not enacting GDPR uh, Article 80.2 will prevent uh, many key rights issues from being scrutinized. Um, and in introducing this part of the law would make political part parties such as Labour, um, who uh, you know we felt uh, may have been less compliant with their legal obligations, both in the the manner and content of their responses to people and the types of data that were being profiled, it may make uh, parties such as that easier to hold to account. And finally, and this is a kind of a very optimistic recommendation, we think political parties should move to a consent-based opt-in model of political profiling. And, you know, we've talked a lot about the, the legal bases that political parties can rely upon to process personal data. Um, you know, the ICO has said, uh, you know, that uh, they think that political parties uh, are very much more limited in what they in what they can and can't process. Um, to some extent, the jury is still out on this, and it's a matter of uh, legal opinion. Um, but in addition, uh, in addition to the fact that processing in this manner, you know, we think is is likely to, to cause kind of uh, har harm or distress. Uh, people seem to not like it. People seem to be uncomfortable with the degree of political profiling going on. We've also highlighted an unspoken truth of political profiling in its current form, which is that largely it doesn't seem to work. And the fact that it doesn't work um, seems to hinge on this over-reliance on commercial data brokers who have, you know, to some extent kind of sold snake oil and, you know, buyers have drunk the Kool-Aid um, of just how good their data sets are. And it's clear to us they're not very good because participants in our survey didn't recognise the profile constructed of them. And, you know, anecdotally, uh, data collected from activities such as canvassing and door knocking and, you know, kind of meaningful voter interactions seems to be a lot better quality. Um, and, you know, if you take that reading to its fullest, it means that probably the quality of political profiling in the UK has probably got worse uh, over the kind of past couple of decades or years. Uh, if, the, if the amount of kind of commercial data, if, if their reliance on commercial data brokers has increased. Um, so to org, the best value for money, most effective and digital rights friendly form of profiling would be an opt-in system of profiling based around consent. And this could revolve largely around keeping up with existing members, interested individuals and in fundraising. This would be more accurate and useful for parties and their supporters, more in line with their expectations. Um, a recent survey by us has suggested that this could be a kind of popular option. Uh, finally, before we go to the questions, I just want to say, um, we have seen some kind of encouraging steps from the political parties on, on in, within their privacy policies. Um, and we've seen that um, they have been making kind of good steps towards, you know, really marking out their legitimate interests. Sorry, really, really marking out um, kind of where they apply lawful bases to different types of data and different types of activities. Um, but we think kind of more work is needed here to really foreground how they're using people's personal data and make it really accessible and kind of easy to understand for the general public. Finally, um, obviously the Labour kind of post-mortem 
came came out last week and um, one of the conclusions of that was that the Labour Party spent loads and loads and loads of money on you know using personal data to serve really targeted narrow ads and it didn't really work when it compared to the Tories um, banner ads um, which did not kind of use personal data in the same way um, so you know that kind of seems to suggest that the use of personal data for political campaigning is not the magic bullet that some have claimed it is. Okay, I'm going to open the floor to questions now. 